Okay, so a very good afternoon to everybody. Thank you for taking time out to actually uh, enjoy your lunch with us while we share about the EV sector in China. So on my on the first part of the of my presentation, I'll actually start off before I hand it over to Tim. So my part will actually be on how to discover opportunities in China's EV sector itself. So before I begin, just a little disclaimer, anything said here will solely be for education purpose only and does not constitute any form of financial advice. All right, so for the EV sector itself, I think that many of you all may have heard about it, but I would like to actually share a little bit more about it. So what are EVs? EVs are actually electric vehicles and it's the evolving trend of the automobile sector. So they're actually seen as a greener, more sustainable solution for the automobile sector, whereby it's powered by a rechargeable battery instead of the traditional uh, gas burning engines. So right now we can see that there have been a lot of countries or in fact uh, policies in place to encourage the use of electric vehicles. So by actually countries adopting electric vehicles, it's actually pretty much dependent on two things. And one is local infrastructure. Second is the local policies on whether they are supportive for the electric vehicles or not. And we can see it slowly, be slowly becoming very apparent across the globe, whereby more and more countries are actually trying to build up infrastructure as well as uh, policies to make it more conducive for the adoption of electric vehicles. Because ever since the Paris Agreement, we can see that a lot of countries have actually been looking towards lowering their carbon emission. And one of the most efficient way to do so is actually by doing on automobiles and therefore by electrifying the whole automobile uh, supply chain and adopting EVs, they are, it's beneficial for the long-term objectives for many countries to reach their carbon goals in the long run. So if we look at it, electric vehicles in terms of sales have actually tripled from 2019 until 2021. This shows the evolving trend of electric vehicles. And I, I think that many of you all have noticed more electric vehicles on the road as well. Or uh, in fact, uh, more policies are in place to to show that hybrid vehicles or electric vehicles are better at fuel efficient, etc. So we can see that right now, there has been 6.6 .6 million registrants globally uh, in terms of electric vehicles. And this is so, slowly, slowly actually growing. And in fact, with it being tripled uh, from 2019 to 2021, people are expecting that going forth, there will be a continued exponential increase in the number of electric vehicles on the roads, as well as uh, people's interest on that. So why look at electric vehicles and why is China a growing source of electric vehicles? Is because electric vehicles growth in China is actually much faster than other markets. So we can see that just the EV sales in 2021 alone, it doubled in China as compared to the rest of the world. So we can see that China itself is pushing for EV adoption greater than other countries, and many of its policies and infrastructure are actually more supportive of it as well. And that's why we feel that China is a growing market for EVs, and it could be looked at uh, more in depth to, on the various uh, growth prospects of EV in the Chinese markets. So why look at the Chinese EV sector? I actually break it down to three key points, and I'll elaborate on them uh, subsequently. The first thing is China is the largest automobile market in the world. And as we look at electrifying the whole supply chain and moving towards EVs, China will actually benefit from that because uh, with much more uh, existing supply already in terms of the automobiles, when these automobiles change to EVs, it will benefit China. Second thing, if we look at China's five-year plan, it has also uh, put EV as a key important factor and it has plans to actually accelerate the EV vehicle deployment. So because of that, in the long run, there's still growth for EVs in the Chinese markets. And lastly, the global EV supply chain is mainly dominated by China and I will actually explain more in depth later. So China is actually the largest automobile market in the world. And we can see that in terms of EVs itself right now, 20 to 30% of the global market share is actually from China. So it shows that uh, China still have more room for growth because right now it has actually one of the largest market share and people are still targeting that market as 
adoption to EVs continue to grow. So rapid adoption of the EVs are pre will present a rare opportunity to expand the global market share in China, uh, for the EVs itself, as well as in China. So we can see that China's auto industry actually accounts for more than one third of the global automobile profit pool. And if you look at it, if you see based on the graph, this is what is projected by Bloomberg Intelligence. And it's seen that the battery electric vehicles going forth in China will continue to actually increase and its petrol vehicles will decrease. So with that in place, it shows that there's much more room for upside in terms of the growth momentum in the China EV sector. And if you look, China also it has very, very supportive policies with regards to electric vehicles. Because we have to note that in China itself, it always has a five-year plan. So in the current five-year plan, aside from all its other uh, focus, like opening up in terms of uh, financial markets, one of it is actually towards the green, greening the economy. And in terms of greening the economy, they have a lot of plans towards the electric vehicle segment. So it's also one of the most supportive government policies in terms of China itself towards the EV industry, comparing globally. And with the Chinese government's five-year plans towards this particular sector, we can see that going forth, there may be more emphasis towards its growth as well as adoption of EVs in China itself. So I'll just explain some of the supportive measures that the Chinese government has actually put in place. First thing first, China has actually qualified subsidies for EV purchases. This actually will encourage uh, people to actually choose EVs instead of traditional uh, automobiles. There's not only that, there's a lot of waivers as well, such as the sales taxes waivers, green license plates, and that there's a national, national carbon credit system for all automakers. This will also encourage automakers to uh, look towards electric vehicles when they are uh, manufacturing them in China. So with all of this tax rebate and subsidies in place, it actually uh, strengthens China's position as an EV leader in terms of adoption of EVs. Aside from that, we can see that the Chinese government's policies actually drove a lot of EV adoption. And when the policies were in place, we can see that the EV penetration rate in China uh, sought significantly higher. Although there are certain uh, concerns that uh, the Chinese government may actually remove some of the measures, right now we can see that the overall policy outlook as well as the direction that chi China is taking is actually towards EV EVs adoption, as well as to change its uh, automobile fleet to electric vehicles. And so that is why we can see that the subsidies are still carrying on. In fact, there have been new subsidies as well as uh, new measures in place to actually encourage the adoption of EVs. So we can see that the EV sector is actually listed as critical in the Made in China 2025 plan as well. And we know that China has this uh, manufacturing plan whereby it encourages sort of like the manufacturers to develop certain equipment in China and have special rebates for them, et cetera. And so with the EV sector being critical in this Made in China 2025 manufacturing plan, it shows that the Chinese government is still very supportive of EV manufacturing in China, and it will still continue to actually support the sector in the long run itself. We can also see that based on the new energy automobile industry plan, it also targets a 20% EV penetration by 2025. So this shows that China in the long run could still look towards uh, the EV development as well as the overall whole, wholesome supply chain and the re relevant infrastructure to support EV sector growth. For those who are skeptical that the uh, sort of like the consumer preference will go towards the uh, other countries, such as consumer preference having maybe uh, looked towards uh, other brands like those uh, Western brands. The latest consumer survey actually shows that there has been a shifting trend in China as well because of the policy trends right now. And right now, the younger generation of Chinese uh, citizens are actually more supportive of local brand names. This is not only in the fashion side of things, 
is also in the automobiles, whereby if we look at the purchase intention, they are more willing to buy domestic EV brands as well. And so this would also change the Chinese landscape for EV vehicles, whereby they will be looking more towards local branding, uh, patronism, as well as uh, heading towards the government's direction of adopting EVs. And so if you look at the supply chain itself, or in fact, how the whole ecosystem of the EV is like, we know that China plays a very important role to the EV sector right now as well, because it's home to third, three fourth of the battery uh, production capacity in terms of globally. And we have to note that battery is actually the main component of an EV. So with China being the market leader, it's actually also showing that there will be more interest towards the China EV sector because of the various supply chains that it has. Not only aside from the batteries, we have also look at the infrastructure as well as the various components. So this picture actually shows uh, what an EV comprises of. And if you look at it, most of the rare components such as graphite, or in fact, if you're looking at copper and aluminum, they are actually produced in China as well. So we can see that because of that, with more, most of the key minerals of the EVs manufactured in China, China will be one of the key beneficiaries of the development of the EV sector as well. So we can see that aside from the batteries, many of the EV supply chain actually has, the, many of the EV supply chain companies are actually based in China as well, or even listed in Hong Kong and China. So because of that, we can see that there's much more interest towards the EV landscape in China as well. So we're looking at the EV manufacturers. I think some of the key names you all may have heard of it before, such as BYD, Geely, NIO, Xpeng, et cetera. And all of them are listed in Hong Kong or China. For BRD, it's listed, dual listed in China and Hong Kong. And if you're looking at the hardware components, because we do know that for EVs itself, aside from the batteries, we're also looking at the chips. We're also looking at the uh, camera component. So a lot of them are based in China and Hong Kong as well. So like Sunny Optical, Sunny Optical is very involved in the lenses of the, of the uh, smart vehicles, whereby the camera lenses, et cetera. And we are looking at Truly International, which actually produces some of the chips as well as uh, Eastern Automation. So these are more of the chip components of the EVs. And the battery components, like we stated that China is the market leader in the battery component seg segment of the EV itself. And we are looking at not only the battery makers, we are also looking at the raw material providers because all of this will be involved in the battery manufacturing process. So we're looking at things like uh, Tangfeng Lithium, Shanghai Putalai New Energy, as well as Zhejiang Kubot. Because uh, like for all of these companies, they are involved in one way or another in the battery making process as well. And lastly, we're looking at infrastructure. As stated at the start of the webinar, what is important in the long run growth of the EV sector in particular countries are two things. First thing is government supported policies. And second thing is the infrastructure requirement, because we all know that if like example, you have an EV, but if the infrastructure is not very sufficient and you don't have like charging points almost everywhere you go, the adoption rate may not be high. And so for infrastructure providers, we can see like Walson Holdings, uh, they actually provide charging points for the uh, electric vehicles. China Tower, which actually provide the charging stations and the electricity needed for these uh, charging stations, as well as Pion Energy, also Pion Technology, also another infrastructure related for EVs. So we are looking at all of this. It actually forms the whole ecosystem of the EV sector. And we can see that because China is home to many of such companies, it makes it more of an attractive location to look at when you're investing in EVs itself. And so if you look at it, China actually dominates most of the battery supply chain in, in the EV sector. So it's responsible for 80% of the world's EV battery raw material refining. And a lot of the raw materials such as the rare earth and graphite are actually mined, mined in China. Even though you can see like other countries they may actually mine more of certain particular raw ingredient. However, they are also owned by Chinese companies. So in fact, right now, China is actually uh, one of the leaders in terms of the 
battery manufacturing as well as the mining component for these rare materials. And so you can see that recently the U, uh, US uh, Treasury Secretary Yellen actually stated that they wanted to rely less on rare materials from China as well. But we can see that China is still dominating in that aspect. So if you look at the graph below, you can see that China, which is highlighted in red, forms many of forms much of the cell components, battery cells, and EV related uh, distribution in terms of production. And in terms of mining, China remains strong in graphite. So we can see like example for, for cobalt, it is, though it's based in another country, but the company that's owning this uh, cobalt miners are actually based in China. So we can see that actually China still controls more or less the supply chain of the battery side in the EV sector. We can also see that China has a robust in terms of the uh, ecosystem to support the EVs as well for the infrastructure wise, because we can look that China has over 808,000 public uh, charging stations out of the 1.4 million globally in 2020. So this is actually more than half of it. And it's the most in the world as well. So it shows that China is very much efficient in terms of infrastructure. And with the infrastructure being uh, very uh, mature, we can see that there may be it would encourage adoption of EVs in China as well. And this will actually bring forth the attractiveness of the EV market in China. So if we look back at our homeland in Singapore, we can see that right now there's still very little uh, charging stations in Singapore. And that's why the government is also encouraging while it's encouraging electric vehicles, it also had stated that it will have to actually build up the infrastructure. And because of that, you can see that there are more charging points related uh, infrastructure being built up. So right now with China being mature in that area, it shows that that uh, infrastructure wise is already very stable. So because of that, it will encourage even much more adoption for EVs. And so if you're looking at the events to look out for this year, since we have talked so much about why the EV sector in China is very attractive at the moment, we have to look at going forth what other policies will be in place to actually encourage uh, the EV sector growth. So we are looking at internal and external factors. And for internal factors, we'll be looking at the policy tone. So right now, you can see that stimulus by the Chinese government on EV sector remains very apparent. And I'll show you why shortly. As well as for external, we're looking at developments in the industry and technology and which is more of the technology advancements to see whether it can bring uh, the EV sector to a next level. So we're looking at the internal events. We can see that China remains very supportive and in fact has plans to actually encourage uh, more EV adoption. So you can see that earlier this month, it has actually unveiled plans to spur car demand by possibly extending the EV tax breaks, as well as in fact, to actually boost automobile demands, Beijing actually has plans for subsidies for EV buyers. So all of these are actually showing that right now, if they want to support the automobile sector, they'll be looking at the EV segment first. And this is right now key to actually help uh, the Chinese economy as well. So the government remains very supportive about that. And that's why we are looking at it very favorably. And if you're looking at external events, I think that what people will be looking for is for huge technological advancements. So like example for CATL, which, one of the, which is one of the uh, key bat battery manufacturers in China, they have come up with a very super powerful battery. And this one is a one charge range of over 1000 km. So it shows that they are still in the market leader in that aspect. And this uh, battery maker is actually uh, still going very strong with this battery, one of the key uh, top end products in the sector. So with much, if more companies or much more uh, positive developments in this sector, it will make the sector more mature and adoption more apparent. Second thing is the supply chain woes that people are looking for. So looking towards, so if the supply chain woes isn't up, or if like example, we see a development in the chip side of things, which will actually make the supply chain uh, easier or certain developments in that area, it will actually help boost the EV sector in the long run as well in terms of adoptations. So we can see that chips are still currently uh, being developed to see whether there will be much more uh, better in terms of supply chain as well as in terms of technology to actually replace the current or upgrade the current uh, EV side of things. With that, 
uh, actually pass the time on to Tim, who may would like to talk about his view on the EV sector as well as some of the stock picks he may have. Tim, please, over to you. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks, Samuel. That was a um, very comprehensive overview of the um, EV landscape in, uh, in China. So uh, thanks for that. Okay, I'll um, share quickly my slides and, uh, and then we can get to Q&A. So let me just uh, share my screen quickly. Okay, there we go. Okay, so I'm going to cover a little bit on the um, larger picture from my view and then also dive into a few ideas. Um, and then we can have Q&A after that to, uh, to see what the audience thinks. So first off, let me just uh, share my screen here. Okay, so disclaimer, nothing in this presentation is meant to be construed as uh, personalized financial advice. So please do your due diligence before you invest in anything as always. Um, okay, so let's start. So I'm gonna quickly go through how the EV market looks because Samuel's already given a very good um, overview of that, but I'll just give you my two cents, my take on, on how I see it. So first off, I think it's pretty obvious, right? China has 1.4 billion people. We see that with consumer stocks. We see that with, um, you know, with Tencent, Baba, those types of names that have really big networks and platforms. Uh, and the same thing really applies to EVs as well, right? So China is just way ahead of the curve uh, versus the US when you're talking about EVs and the percentage of, of EV sales. Um, and as Samuel alluded to earlier, you know, they have targets. And so the government is really, really pushing for EVs to become a bigger part of new vehicle sales in China. And obviously about a decade ago, China overtook the US to be the largest auto market in the world. And it stayed in front ever since. And it, it, has, it doesn't look like it's going to relinquish um, that title anytime soon. So the law of large numbers, right? It's absolutely huge. And so what does that mean for investors? Um, it means there are going to be multiple players in the space operating you know, in the EV space. And so you have the big guys like BYD and Tesla China and uh, you know, GM uh, Wuling, which is actually a, is actually a, um, a joint venture between GM and, and Syke. So there are a couple of lesser known names, and then obviously you get down further further down the list, you have names like Neo that are a bit more familiar, Li Auto, um, that are really mostly actually just uh, just EVs or pure EV plays rather. Um, so BYD, I think earlier this year actually said it would stop producing uh, ICE, so ICE, conventional uh, engines, like internal combustion engine vehicles. So they're going completely electric as well. Um, so it means basically that there's a lots of options for, for consumers and for investors. So how do you think about, you know, where you want to put your money or which force you want to, you know, put your, your money on in terms of, in terms of the, um, the race to be number one in China. Okay. So I'm just going to cover a couple of interesting companies in the sector, um, as well as one ETF, which I think is an interesting idea for, for investors to consider as well. Um, so first off, Neo. I think we all know about NEO listing in Singapore recently on the SGX. That's a big coup, I think, for Singapore Exchange. But also, it really talks to NEO's aspirations to really expand outside of China and to actually think about overseas markets. So here you can look at the monthly deliveries. It's already um, sort of picked up in May and June off the, off the low in April. Um, so you're seeing those lockdowns have an effect, obviously, in the first quarter going into the second quarter, but that's starting to pick up. Um, so NEO's a few years ago was actually close to bankruptcy, but it's had a really interesting um, renaissance ever since. It's, it got actually a government bailout, I think, in late 2019. And ever since then, it's really taken off. And so what's really behind that is a really unique business model, which uh, I've actually covered in, a, in an article on, on our site. And so battery swaps is a is a concept that is really the USP of NEO. So for NEO, there are battery swap stations. So as Samuel said earlier, the battery is actually the main part or, or the rechargeable battery is the main part of an actual EV. And it actually also happens to be the most expensive component of an EV. So if consumers in China and obviously where they launch will be given the option, are given the option to either purchase the vehicle with the battery, uh, owning the battery, or to lease the battery. So having a battery as a service, uh, so to speak. And what that means is that they can then, they get maybe two or three free battery swaps um, included at these battery swap stations when, they're, when their battery is running low. And then after that, they pay you know, a monthly or an annual fee for, uh, for battery swaps uh, going on from there. So what that gives is you know, a lot more optionality. And I think it's a model that really works 
only in China, just because in China, cities and people really um, are, are kind of uh, densely populated. So they're actually not that much, um, you know, it's not as widespread as, say, the US, where there's sprawling spaces. In China, there's lots more urban conurbations that are uh, that are quite tightly packed. So this allows the battery pack stations to actually be um, closely located to where people either live or not that far away from where they are. So Neo actually has its own target to have about 90% of, um, of Neo owners be within about three kilometers of a battery pack station by 2025. So it kind of shows you the aspirations of, of Neo and how they kind of see themselves um, in, in, this, in this field. And so an interesting thing about Neo as well is that it actually launched in Norway last year, uh, which is a big sort of you know, proponent of EVs. You have Scandinavian countries that are really, pop, uh, really, really keen on promoting EVs. Uh, and they're going to be launching in Germany, the Netherlands, Sweden, and uh, Denmark um, later this year. So there's really an intention from Neo, Neo management to really uh, push the, the brand outside of just China. Uh, and obviously, I think with the listing in Singapore, they had an announcement that they would also open an R&D center in Singapore as well. And you would expect naturally that they would eventually launch, uh, you know, Neo here in Singapore, probably within the next uh, two to three years. But there's been no announcement on when that will happen. Um, so that's an interesting company, I think, from the Chinese perspective, from the pure China EV uh, manufacturer perspective. Uh, and then we have Tesla, right? I mean, there's no surprises here. It's probably, um, you know, one that everyone's heard of, I, I would hope. Uh, but I think it's a really good example of maybe where some of these Chinese EV makers might be earlier in their life cycle, whereas Tesla has been around for, you know, over a decade now. So it's really established itself as a global EV manufacturer. Um, and it's key, you know, its key metrics continue to improve. So last, um, last quarter operating cash flow hit a record um, in terms of, uh, in terms of uh, the quarter, I think it was 3.6 billion. So that was a billion above consensus, which came in at 2.6 billion. Um, and even without these, you know, carbon credits that they have, they're, um, you know, they're operating at a very, very uh, profitable scale. And so I think they've really put to bed all those doubts that a lot of the uh, naysayers had about the business model. Um, and they're starting to ramp up in China as well. And so that's something that investors who want access to the Chinese EV space should definitely think about Tesla because Tesla, as you can see, um, generates about 25% of its revenue uh, from China. So in its latest quarter, that was about 25%. That may drop off uh, this quarter with, with some of the lockdowns and Im impacting production. Um, but I think longer term, you know, the opening of the Gigafactory in Shanghai, the commitment from Musk to China, I think there's really a um, there's really an opportunity there for the company. But again, there's also a risk, right? So it's a bold strategy. They wanna access a huge, huge market in China. Um, but it's a double-edged sword, right? So I think there's always going to be geopolitical tensions, which you have to really think about and contend with as, as an investor in, in any uh, sort of business. But I think they are playing, you know, to the strengths of, of the Chinese government. The Chinese government wants to promote this uh, industry. And Tesla is obviously in this industry. It's just if there's any backlash against American brands or anything, you know, that, that, that the Chinese government may use as, uh, as leverage against Tesla, then that there's a risk, right? So there's opportunity and a risk, but that's a double-edged sword, I think, with any, any sort of foreign brand that operates in China, that's what you would expect. But I think in Tesla, you have a, a company that is, that is doing phenomenally well, both in the US, uh, in China, and obviously the rest of the, rest of the world as well. So there's, there's a bit more diverse diversification, I think, in, in Tesla stock, um, but there's also uh, the exposure to the China story, which is, is, as Samuel said, super, super exciting. Um, okay, finally, I'm going to cover a EV ETF, which I think is really something that investors that don't want to think about picking stocks and think about picking, um, you know, uh, individual winners is actually a really good idea if you want exposure to the whole supply chain, the ecosystem that, that Samuel talked about. Um, and so the big one listed in Hong Kong is Global X, uh, the China EV ETF. Uh, China Electrical Vehicle and Battery ETF. Um, so it's trades in Hong Kong dollars uh, and also trades in US dollars, the tickers uh, are, are there. Um, and so actually, instead of having a lot of exposure to direct manufacturers and pure play manufacturers, it actually has a bit more of a, a tilt towards the battery tech, uh, the supply chain, the component manufacturers, um, you know, Gang Feng Lithium, for example, uh, providing the, the minerals and, the, uh, and, and really the, the raw materials for the, for the batteries. 
Um, BYD, which is obviously a big battery manufacturer as well as a vehicle manufacturer. Um, and CAT, you know, CATL, which, uh, which Samuel mentioned, which is the largest battery manufacturer in the world. And so there's a lot more exposure to the mainland listed A shares market, which I think is gives a bit more of a, uh, it's less correlated to global markets like the US and Hong Kong, uh, for example. And so I think if you are thinking about, um, about tapping into EVs, then I think this is probably one of the biggest EV uh, pure play, you know, sort of EV ETFs just focused on China. Uh, and from my perspective, I think it's actually a good idea to think about uh, an ETF if you're not super, super interested in the sector and really diving deep into the financials. Because um, at the moment in China, it's still the early stages where people are, you know, companies are really um, sort of spending big on marketing, branding, and, and, and trying to get market share. And so the winner is not, it's not entirely sure who's going to come out really, really big. There will be multiple winners, I'm sure. Um, but this is a great way, I think, to, to really benefit from the picks and shovels approach to, uh, to the growth of the sector, which is obviously going to be big. Um, and finally, I would just say, you know, look for broad exposure. I think that relate, relays back to the ETF. Think about, uh, think about diversifying when you do own, say, a basket of stocks in the ETF space. If you want to go stock picking, don't just you know, go buy, I don't know, 100% of your EV exposure to Tesla or, or 100% to Neo, 100% to Lee Auto. I think think about your weightings, how you want to have um, a mix if you want to think about a basket or if you want to go for the ETF route. I think that's also a great way to play it. So I think overall, this is a, a super exciting sector as, as, um, as Samuel has, has really outlined. And I think there are definitely opportunities for investors to um, to benefit from uh, this trend. So I'll leave it there um, and we can take some Q&A. Uh, so please do share any questions that you may have in the Q&A box and then I can pose it to either myself or Samuel. So Samuel, should we do the first? Uh, hold on a minute. Sorry. Should we do the first? Um, should we do the first question, Samuel? Are you, sure. you ready? Sure. Yeah. Okay. Cool. <laughs> okay, let me uh, let me get let me put up uh, the questions here. Um, hold on a minute. Okay. I'm just gonna get the Q and A. We've got one on Singapore. Um, it's not Tim. While you're pulling it out, let me uh, touch a little bit more about the ETS since you were saying that. ETS is a good start for the EV sector. Hmm. So actually, I personally agree with Tim as well, because what happens is that for ETF swipes, they are actually allowed to buy into certain companies that mass retail are not able to buy. So like example, like CATL, which was mentioned just now, or in fact, even ETH Energy, which is also another battery manufacturer. All of this are actually listed in the Chinex exchange. And the Chinex exchange right now, only allows uh, institutional as well as corporate buyers to buy into it. So even though it's available on the Stock Connect, retail investors are unable to purchase this kind of uh, Chinex listed stocks. And a lot of the EV sector supply chains, in fact, the more prominent ones are listed on Chinex or the Star, the Starbot at Shanghai Exchange. So all of these are still not sort of like very accessible to the retail investors. And one one way that the sort of like the retail investors can tap onto this is their ETFs. So ETFs do have a good holdings of, of this related companies because at the end of the day, these companies are the more major market players in the EV supply chain. And so by tapping onto the various uh, ETFs, we can get a more wholesome uh, sort of like exposure to the EV sector as well. And this may be a uh, good for people who like to get started in the EV segment, but uh, yet not uh, do stock picks. No, that's a good point. Yeah, um, I think because, yeah, as, as you said, the A shares market, I mean, even if you do want to buy um, through the Stock Connect, it's there's only certain stocks that you're actually eligible to buy and you have to think about the currency exchanges and, and all that. So it's a bit of a pain, I think, for, um, for the sort of man on the street retail investor. So if you do want to, uh, do you want to access these names listed in China? It's probably easier to do it through an ETF. Um, okay, so, okay, yeah, first question. Let me just share the screen so that everyone can kind of see, uh, see the question. Okay, so the first one is, okay, any data on the EV 
uh, EVs for Singapore market, you know, EV versus conventional fuel powered uh, uh, vehicles. Um, okay, so Samuel, uh, I, I actually know about, um, I think I saw last year's numbers were about 1,740 EVs were sold in Singapore. So it's still, it's still measured in the thousands uh, or, or single digit thousands. Um, and I think that made up 3.8% of new car registrations here in Singapore. Uh, that was up 17 fold on 2020. So that shows you there's you know increasing demand. And I think over half of those 1,740 were Tesla. So Tesla is a big, big player here already. It's established itself. Uh, it's the go-to name. Um, but I think over the next few years, it's going to be an important, uh, it's going to be an important sector for the government to promote. I think maybe in the 2010s, there were a little bit, uh, you know, conflicting interests, maybe with oil and gas, a lot of oil and gas names being uh, based here. But I think the government has really shifted its focus to sustainability and thinking about EV sector in Singapore. So I think, I personally think that it will be one that will continue to grow in Singapore. I don't think it will make much of a dent or a difference rather to companies' bottom line. I think exciting place to be. So um, yeah, that, that's all I have on, on Singapore market. How about you, Samuel? For, for me on Singapore, I don't have any uh, key, key hard figures at the moment right now because uh, like uh, stated, I was actually concentrating on China. But that being said, Singapore is still a very premature area for the EV sector because we are if you are looking at in terms of the infrastructure, we are still in the progress of building them as well. And if you're looking at the numbers, like what you mentioned just now, we are still in the thousands. So it actually still brings a lot of opportunities for players to come in to set up their various supply chains as well. In fact, if you're looking at the various infrastructure, charging points, or in fact, EV adoption, we are still in the growing phase. And I think that government's policies are very supportive at the moment, because if you look at the LTA website, right now they are still actually going towards, uh, leading towards the greening of our vehicle fleet. And in fact, a lot of our public vehicles are slowly becoming electric vehicles as well. Some of them include our buses as well as our taxis. So if you look at it, uh, BYD is one of the prominent names being used by our buses right now, as well as some of our taxis as well. So I think that going forth with uh, more supportive government policies, as well as the area becoming more niche, as well as uh, more developed, we can see that there may be more room for growth in Singapore's uh, EV markets as well. Yeah, no, that's a good point. I think BYD, uh, you do tend to see the taxis around. I think they've got a contract in Hong Kong as well. So I think BYD is one of those names that will probably do more of the less sexy niche sectors like bus fleets and taxi fleets that maybe the Teslas and the you know the, the European marquee names don't really want to touch. But I think there will still be profitable um, areas to, to, to watch out for as well. Um, OK, so let's go on to the next question. Um, let me just share that. But I think there still be profit. Um, so what is your view of investing in rare earths as it's a critical component for EVs? Um, what do you think about that, uh, Samuel? Oh. Actually, I feel that rare earths is a very interesting opportunity to look at because right now China is actually one of the key uh, mining grounds for rare earths. And of which is also one of the key suppliers globally in terms of rare earth as well. So if we look at the Sino-US trade war that happened a few years back, one of the key bargaining chips used by China was in terms of rare earths. Because rare earths itself is not just used for EVs, it's also used for many other electronics as well. But with the up and coming of the EV sector, there is much more importance placed on rare earth. And right now, with a lot of the mining conducted in China or actually being dominated by Chinese companies in terms of mining, because, like example, China do have many exclusive contracts to actually mine rare earth overseas, this will be more one of the more interesting areas to view going forth. And I think that uh, with more and more adoption of uh, electric vehicles as well as electronics that require rare earth, it will become one of the key importance in terms of the supply chain going forth as well. And right now, there's still no direct replacement for rare earths, as even though it's used uh, in minimal amounts, it's still one of the key important ingredients. Yeah, no, I agree. I think um, I think rare earths are one of those that are very very interesting. But you do have to watch out for the, um, I guess the vicissitudes or the vagaries of that market. Like you know, commodities, you, you can see it go up. I mean, oil stayed quite high, but then things like um, 
you know, copper and, and other uh, sort of metals, uh, precious metals or other fine metals, they've come down. Um, but I think longer term, there's there's definitely a, an argument to uh, to investing in uh, in rare earths because it is so critical to, uh, as, as you said, like battery tech as well, battery production. Um, OK, so next up, let's move on to the next question, which is, I think, quite an interesting one talking about the risks. So what's the biggest risk investors should watch out for in the EV space? Um, Samuel, I guess you can take this one first. All right, sure. No problem. I think that the biggest risk will definitely be the support, government support. So if you are looking at it, it's the subsidies. Because what happens is that if you look at my slides and what I presented just now, the penetration rate in China, as well as in the EV space, and the adoption of a lot of these EV-related policies are all government-driven. They have to have supportive policies in place. They have to have the infrastructure in place. And all of this will drive up EV adoption. And so if they remove certain subsidies, people may sort of like waver in terms of deciding whether they want an EV or they want a traditional vehicle. And I think in the long run, this is very important in terms of the global mindset as well. With more global governments actually focusing more on the greener side of things, and they're looking towards meeting carbon emission goals, EVs become one of the sectors that is, has the lowest barrier of entry for them to breach as well as for them to adopt. And we can see that China is in, in terms is being the market leader in terms of adoption right now. And as other countries start to do so, we can see that the whole EV uh, pool or, or we call it the EV pie itself will start to expand. And I think that once governments actually stop focusing on that area, then we can see that maybe the public interest towards that will dwindle. But that being said, I don't foresee that happening anytime soon because right now the global direction is still towards uh, the greening of our economy as well as uh, more of like the ESG related kind of components. Mm. Yeah, um, I, th I think, yeah, no, that, that's definitely true. I think from my, my perspective, I think there are two, two sort of big risks. I think, you know, number one, um, it's a very globalized um, supply chain in the EV space. So I think any sort of rollback of globalization, what you kind of see of this deglobalization trend, I think is probably going to be structurally negative for EVs. I mean, you think about the partnerships between something like a NEO, it partners with NVIDIA and AMD. I think it partners with AMD on R&D development of its vehicles. And then it, it partners with NVIDIA on in, in sort of in-vehicle tech. So I think, you know, it's so um, integrated in global supply chains and you've kind of seen that with the chip shortages, uh, you know, that's had really global ramifications. So anything that is going to impact, um, you know, geo geopolitics that impact the global supply chains, I think it's going to be ne negative. And that's probably one of the bigger risks because even though China's developed this whole ecosystem for battery tech, they still need chips. They still need other components that go into these vehicles. And same with the U.S., right? The U.S., needs um you know chinese batteries needs you know certain rare earths minerals that go into into batteries as well so i think from both ends um from the china the us all, all those geopolitical tensions i think um it's really quite a striking example of globalization the success of globalization how how the chinese ev um and the global ev market kind of uh, operates i think for china specifically and this is number two i'd say is the consumer you know if there's really sort of a, a, I guess, a crash in consumer confidence. If there's any crisis in, in the Chinese economy, you're kind of seeing growth slow already um, in Q2. I, I think there's talk of not being able to meet that 5.5% growth target that the Chinese government has. If there's any COVID zero continuing, and then if there's, you know, these property problems that are coming to, to the surface. I mean, if that, if that accelerates and goes further, then I think there could be issues with consumer confidence, but that will affect lots of sectors, not just EV. So I think that's something to watch out for in China, just to be aware that if there is a you know, consumer uh, confidence, cri crisis of confidence in consumer behavior, then there's, a, you know, there's definitely, um, there's definitely, that's one thing that probably people will cut back on is, is car purchases, right? So I think those are two big, big uh, sort of risks to think about just to have in the back of your mind when you, when you invest into the sector. Actually, I agree with you, Tim, especially on the chip uh, related issues because like China being the market leader in the battery component in the EV sector, the US and Europe still remains the market leaders in terms of the chip components. And many of the chip components are from uh, US and Europe itself. Yeah. And right now we've, we see that uh, US still remaining uh, very uh, prudent on its uh, 
importation of technology to China. So we can see that right now, because of that, it has resulted in their supply, uh, supply chain squeeze. And because of that, we can see that the chip shortage situation is worsening. So I think that right now we have to see whether the US will actually implement that bill to actually uh, have more uh, manufacturers uh, produce their chips in the US itself and whether uh, this supportive bill will be actually passed by Congress maybe this week. Yeah. I think that also relates back to maybe some of the, the, the Chinese manufacturers. Like they obviously just haven't even bothered launching in the US just because it's such a hostile market where they're looking to launch overseas. They're looking to European countries or they're looking to Southeast Asia. They're much more hospitable environments, I think, in terms of the, the politics. Um, so you don't really see Chinese EV makers trying to launch models in the US or trying to compete at that kind of <laughs> stage. So I think it kind of tells you uh, the relationship at this point and, and, and where it's at. So um, yeah, so, so I think that was our final, do we have one more? Oh, sorry, I think we have a couple more um, questions. Uh, let me just do this. Oh, okay, yeah, there we go, thanks. Okay, so um, how convertible EVs uh, how convertible EVs to autonomous vehicles? Okay, so I think this is trying to ask, you know, um, I guess what is the what's the transition phase from from converting EVs to autonomous vehicles? It's it, you know, it, I, I guess our companies uh, close to, I guess, producing autonomous vehicles, or is it? I think it's one of those that I don't know. What, what do you think, Samuel? I think we are still at the very early stages of that because autonomous vehicles that are they are sort of like different levels and yeah if you're looking at the final level which is the level five the full autonomous vehicles we are still I, I think that the society is still not fully ready for it because there are a lot of uh, tests still ongoing even if you look back in Singapore we can see a lot we can see a lot of tests but the test even though they yield results we can see that society itself is not fully receptive of uh, fully converting to autonomous vehicles throughout mm. uh, the nation etc so I think that right now we have to go back down back to a uh, supply chain, whereby if we are looking at supply chain, if for EVs to fully convert to autonomous vehicles, the supply chain will also be impacted in one way or another. And a lot of this uh, supply chain issues, or, or I would say the supply chain uh, manufacturers are actually already producing EVs. So it's just a matter of more focus on certain things. Just like for autonomous vehicles, one of the key focus will be more the lens components. So we can see that maybe the lens makers will be uh, have more benefits going forth. If like example, we are actually aging towards that. But right now, I think that we have to take one step at a time and we are looking at converting to EVs first. And then maybe after from EVs, then we are looking at full autonomous driving going forth, which may take maybe around at least a 10 to 20 years for the thing to fully develop, in my opinion. Yeah. Yeah. I think they were talking about fully autonomous, like, by 2021, that was like 10 years ago, right? And that's, we're like, <laughs> you know, like nowhere near. So I think there's always optimism about when we can go fully autonomous. But as, as you said, I think there is an aversion from consumers and from society about the safety aspect, even though actually on paper, it's probably a lot safer. But if you have a, if you have one death from a Tesla, you know, autopilot, it's like, oh, this means that this is dangerous. You know, I think there's an aversion to a death related to AI or to autopilot versus, you know, how, how many human errors do, do, do normal drivers make, right? And how many deaths. But I think it's just the thought that you're not in control. So I think society really has to come around to that um, idea of, uh, of being, of trusting autonomous vehicles. But I'm sure if we do go fully autonomous one day, there'll be a lot less um, road deaths and, and deaths associated with driving generally. Um, but I think that day is off, is some way off, as you said, Samuel, probably at least at least a decade away or, or more. Um, okay, yeah, so I think we've got two more questions and hopefully we can finish by, by one. Okay, so two rare earths mines slated to come online in Australia in the next two or three years. Any views on these opportunities? Um, okay, so I think we don't really cover Australian stocks i think i know it's i think i've heard of it being linus i'm not sure if it's linus which is one of the is one of the australian rare earth miners um but for, for my perspective rare earths are an interesting way an interesting commodity but i also think they're highly politicized because of the rarity and, and the leverage that goes into them so there's you know talk about opening rare earth mines in canada and in australia 
Um, uh, but I, I don't really have a take, to be honest. I'm not a commodities expert in rare earths. Um, I think it would be an interesting play from a very minimal exposure if you're not familiar. Um, I don't know what you, you your thoughts, Samuel, if you have any thoughts on, on the mine in particular in, in Australia. Actually, it's not just Australia. And in fact, a number of countries have stated that they want to increase their rate of uh, sort of like mining. This is after uh, sort of like the Sino-US tensions, which actually uh, created awareness that a lot of the rails were from China. And in fact, a lot of them were dependent on China for rail supplies. But I would say that even if the rail mines come up and people start digging for them, it's still at a very, very early stage, whereas China's rail market is already very developed with the supply chains, as well as the contracts they have signed with the various uh, key manufacturers, etc. Mm. So I think that it will still need some time. And we do know that mine, mining itself uh, is not a 100% foolproof industry because you can discover or you cannot discover. And depending on that, on how deep you have to mine to it and the relevant uh, risks involved, I would say that we are still at a very premature stage to state how it's going to impact. And only when the sort of like the numbers start coming up, whereby let's say if it's a very uh, stable supply from the Australian mines that come about that may want to disrupt the whole uh, the, the supply in terms of that there are much more supply of rails on the market right now, then we'll be looking towards how this is going to impact markets from there but right now i'll say we are still uh, premature to be actually discussing that yeah no definitely um agree okay i think we've got one more question uh from the audience okay so china currently dominates the ev supply chain as as you mentioned samuel um could you share how the u.s china relationship could affect this development and is there any other countries in the region that could compete in this space uh for example japan or thailand Okay, sure. So uh, I would say that Sino-US relations have been dominating uh, uh, this kind of uh, topics as well, because end of the day, like we can see that there's much hostility between both sides. And in fact, uh, one very good example will be on Tesla as well, whereby Tesla is actually facing a lot of uh, issues in this uh, Chinese uh, manufacturing plant, as well as uh, Chinese sales, because I think the whole politics actually politicize things. If you're looking at regional players, I would say that Japan and Korea are actually trying to penetrate into this market and trying to be an alternative to China as well. Because we do know that uh, Korea and Japan are key manufacturers of automobiles. And so, like example, if you look at your Toyota, etc., they're also developing their battery-related as well as EV-related, I would say, uh, equipment to try to fight with the with uh, to try to compete in this space. And in fact, there have been positive reviews about what is going on in Japan and Korea and South Korea. But however, that being said, much more time is needed. It's because what happened is that China had this competitive advantage whereby it started two to three years earlier. It was one of the frontiers in the EV segment whereby people were still skeptical about it. And because of that, they are not right now reaping the fruits of the labor. And because we can see that even our Southeast Asian uh, side, like sort of like Japan and South Korea, they are trying to enter and using their expertise in the automobile sector. However, we say still that time is still needed for them to actually integrate into it and for sort of like for other parts of the supply chain to actually fully trust them as well as to actually integrate their products into it. Mm -hmm. So I would say that right now, we definitely can look out for this uh, emerging players, but we still have to keep an eye out for, mark for China, which remains the market leader at the moment. Yeah. No, I am. Um, I agree. I think. I think Korea, uh, Japan. I think there's like Panasonic is one of the big battery manufacturers globally as well. Um, so that's in the EV space. So I think that supplies a lot of the big, uh, big auto manufacturers for for EVs. Um, and I think with concerns, you know, regards to chips, like you have TSMC and Samsung, and um, those guys, they ha are starting to open plants in the US and in Europe. Um, which could, you know, I guess, potentially supply also EV makers uh, outside of, of China. So they don't just have, uh, you know, chip production uh, focused in, the, in, in Asia, which is, I think, a concern of the U.S. government was that there's too much uh, sensitive chip production focused in, in Taiwan and Korea. Um, so they, they want those supply chains to be diversified a bit outside. And so I think that's, 
But I think that's just a trend that you see globally anyway. I think people are trying to expand their supply chains outside of China. There was a lot of, I think there was the watershed moment was during COVID when there was a realization that, you know, all the masks and everything were being supplied in China, but they, there were issues with exporting it and there were, you know, there was a lot of price gouging. So I think that really came to a head with, with COVID. And then since then, you've kind of seen um, some of the beneficiaries would probably be in Singapore. It's something like a venture, which is, you know, got manufacturing facilities in, in Malaysia and, 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 and some in China. So I think these guys are going to pick up some business, but China is still so huge and so in, in integrated and so integral to the supply chain that I don't think, um, you know, it, it can be completely diversified away from China, but there will definitely be more countries, I think, picking up uh, business. And Thailand is already a big auto manufacturing hub. So um, I think that could definitely um, that could definitely play a part in the transition away from uh, maybe away from China. But um, but as, as Samuel said, I think it's it's so big and it's so important. Right. So it's still going to play a big part. Yeah, I think that's it. Right, Crystal? Yep. Thanks, Tim and Samuel. And uh, we hope you enjoyed today's session. So to actually help us better understand what we can actually do for do better in future sessions, do help us complete this survey by scanning the QR code or click on the link via the chat box. Thank you. We hope to see you again. Thanks everybody. Hope everyone enjoyed it. Thank you. Thank you. Bye.